Good morning. I'm Leslie Davis Met, Director of the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Before I introduce our speaker for the morning, we're going to have a brief statement from Texas State Senator Jose Menendez. Hi, I'm State Senator Jose Menendez, and I'd like to welcome you to Holocaust Remembrance Week of 2022. I am so pleased you're joining students from across Texas and learning about the Holocaust. I also want to say thank you to the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission, to the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio, and to all of the partners who've made these educational resources available to schools across the whole state of Texas. In 2019, state representative calls on the governor of the state to designate a Holocaust Remembrance Week in order to educate students about the Holocaust and inspire a sense of responsibility to recognize and uphold human value that helps prevent future atrocities. The bill passed both the House and Senate unanimously. That tells you how important this effort is to all of us. Senate Bill 1828 was made possible because of the persistence of local upstanders who call themselves the four ladies in a car because of their frequent trips to Austin on a mission to have a state designated Holocaust Remembrance Week in Texas. They understand that it is a solemn duty to remember the Holocaust and to foster communities of awareness, care, and kindness. You're going to learn the stories of survivors of the Holocaust and about the upstanders whose compassionate actions saved many lives. You too can be heroes by speaking up whenever you witness injustice around you or create change by working with your neighbors and local leaders to improve your community. I invite you to continue learning year round about the heroic acts of upstanding. And just like the four ladies in a car, please reach out to your elected officials in order to make a difference. You're always welcome to reach out to me at 210-733-6604. And I wanna thank you for joining me today. And I hope you share everything you learned throughout this observation of the Holocaust Remembrance Week with everyone you meet. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Senator. Before I introduce this morning's speaker, Winslow Swart, I'd like to remind all of you tuning in that you do have the opportunity through the Q&A and chat to submit questions during Mr. Swart's presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Winslow Swart. Winslow is the founder and chief inspiration officer of Winslow Consulting and co-founder of One Million Dreams, a dream mentor platform. He is on the University of the Incarnate Word MAA Advisory Board and is the recent past chair of the Federation's Jewish Community Relations Council. Mr. Swart. Thanks, Leslie. I'm excited to be with you all this morning um, and to talk about topics that are near to our hearts. Um, and some, some of this, conversations are, are difficult conversations to have, but they're important to know about. Um, not only the takeaways, what we can learn from the lessons um, and these experiences, but also that um, as upstanders, you know, one of the things that we, we challenge in our world today is not just anti-Semitism, but Holocaust denial and uh, misinformation. So through the sharing of stories and artifacts and exhibits, um, we can not only deepen our understanding, but also broaden the, uh, the knowledge that this stuff did happen. And it's only through knowledge and understanding historical events, not just in context, but also in impact that we can perhaps prevent these things from ever happening again. Um, today's topic uh, theme was inspired by a project that my brother Alex Swart worked on when there was a film festival um, at UCLA 
and it, it really taught, it covered Holocaust events in the Netherlands. So heroes, traders, and collaborators, you know, is kind of inspired today's talk. And I'm going to talk about all these three things as they, as they directly affected my own family um, and many others. So I'm going to see it, and this advances with, find out a sentence, this button. The other one. Ah, got it. Very good. Okay. So I'm Winslow Swart. I am the child, the son of a Holocaust survivor. It's my mother. Um, and my father was also in Holland during the occupation and fought a few wars thereafter. So there's going to be some stories that are personal accounts of theirs and experiences, as well as other relatives that I've had the opportunity to meet and read about. Um, so Let's we'll start with the, the, the yellow star that many of us are familiar with. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, when when the Nazis occupied a land, um, you know, they distributed, they distributed these bolts of fabric and the, the residents actually had to cut out the stars themselves and sew them on their own garments. And if you weren't wearing the garment, Yo is Dutch for Jew. You also see them in French, you see them in German, you see them in other languages, Yuda, Juif. Um, other other ways of spelling it in, in whatever the host culture was. Yod is the Dutch one. Yodza is kind of a plural for it. Um, if you were caught, if you were a Jew and you were caught not wearing the yellow star when you were out and about, that was punishable by death or quick deportation to an, ex, to an, to an extermination camp or at the very least a beating. Um, and I remember my mother, you know, she talked about where having to wear the star and how embarrassing it was, how humiliating, you know, you're, you were not even a second or third class citizen. Your human rights were stripped of you and you were looked at differently, treated differently. My mom had a sweet tooth. Uh, she loved candy. And at great risk to herself, she would cover up her yellow star and go into the candy store and buy a little bit of candy. She had a few, a few guilders. Um, that's just crazy. What could have happened to her, right? For just that little thing. And just imagine any other normal thing that we do in our life in society today. These things were rights that were taken away, stripped of us during the occupation of the Netherlands by the Nazis. So day-to-day -day life was, was really uh, turned on its head for so many. Uh, so that's just kind of one case in point. Some of my references are not just the storytelling from my parents, but they're historical, they're documented. And as I read some of the books that I've gotten a hold of, and a lot of them are in Dutch, I'm actually reading about my relatives, sometimes by name. So that's kind of fun. I'll share a little bit of that with you. Um, this one is, is Remembering Jewish Amsterdam, is, is this particular book. And it has some great vignettes. And it's, it's authored by many people that were interviewed, so that makes it super interesting. Um, there's another book that I drew my, uh, some of my references of, there's a book called Mutthausen about the concentration camp that was in uh, Austria, and it's where my, my grandfather was murdered, and there's a couple pages about his life and his story, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about that. But in Holland during the occupation, um, it was really a time of, of, de of a depression, a recession, uh, a, a collapsed economy. The Nazis came in, they took all the good stuff, and, and the people who lived um, in, in the country had what was barely left over. Uh, so even before being taken off to concentration camps, people were living a very, very difficult life. They were struggling, especially the Jews, but also the rest, the rest of the Dutch people had it tough. Um, their primary mode of transportation was actually uh, taken away from them, the bicycle. Right, you know, so all you see all the Nazis riding, riding around on, on, on the Dutch citizens' bikes, and I found that very offended, offensive. Um, but uh, you know, my mother painted this, and it just kind of even she recalls as a little girl, you know, it's it's a person sitting on the street reading a newspaper about city people sitting on the street, you know, uh, unemployed, you know, so there's a little bit of a, a wit to that here, you know, the unemployed person reading about themselves. Um, but, but in terms of evidence, you know, it's, it's not just the storytelling, we also have the artifacts. What I want to share with you real quick, you know, if, if anybody wonders, you know, did the, not, did, did the Holocaust really happen? Okay, of these, well, I'm pretty much all of us, you know, can agree, yes, it did. But here's a little bit of proof. So this was, um, 
my grandmother and who was with my mom was with her in the camps. Uh, this was their change of address form from one barrack to another in the Westerbork transit camp before they were taken to Berkshire and Belsen. Um, and in the transit camp, which is basically a, it's a, it's a concentration camp where people are kind of shipped all over, you know, it's, it's a hub essentially. Um, and having a change of address form, I think there's, there's such irony to it that while you're in line waiting to be sent off to possibly be murdered, exterminated, God forbid you wouldn't get your mail. That's how organized the Nazis were to make sure that, you know, you would get your postage. The irony there, right? There's another uh, form that I have that was uh, my mother's. She had lived in the, in the Kreipamstraat, which is called the Transvalbert in Amsterdam. Um, Hen uh, Hendrik Berlach had designed these really wonderful neighborhoods. And this was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. But here it is after the war when she's going to the uh, displaced persons camp and they're filling out her, her you know, personal information, right? Uh, the most striking field on this one, she's 14 years old. My mom had been in, in three different concentration camps, Gretchen Belson primarily. And they asked her what was her occupation and she answers without any, any irony in her voice, of course, she answers, Hafanga, prisoner. That was my mom's occupation in her mind, her reality. Um, she did some amazing things with her life after that, but that's just a, a chilling moment. And then here's, here's the evidence. Um, but, you know, she taught us, you know, to be positive people with, with a great outlook and um, not to be bitter. She wasn't bitter. As much as she had harmful, painful stories, she took away a love of life and a love of people. And so, um, so I thank her for that. My, uh, my grandfather is a super interesting guy. Um, he ran a, a restaurant in, in the Netherlands, fine dining, Italian, maitre d'. And during the occupation, most of the, most of the clientele were, were SS, they were, and they were Nazis. And the head of the SS in the Netherlands, a guy named Sam Olai, L-O-L-I-J is how he spelled his last name, would come in, run up a big tab, and then not pay for it. And uh, my grandfather was already sus suspected of, of working and doing subversive activities in the underground, uh, trying to foil some of the Nazis' you know, efforts. But he had a confrontation here with, with, with this SS officer, demanding that he sell his bill. He just said, you just can't come in here and eat whatever you want, drink all the champagne, and you know, it's not on us. You know? um, Two days later, my grandfather was taken away to Munhausen to the camp. And uh, a couple of days after that, he was shot. So, uh, you know, he was, I, I guess he felt like he was doing the right thing, but it certainly cost him. Um, but him and my, my uh, uncles all had this little program. They, they, they were part of a boxing gym that was owned by Joel Kostman. Uh, Joel Kostman wound up, uh, being a, a relative in the sense that uh, an in-law, his daughter married my, my oldest uncle. Uh, her name was Flora. And uh, so my grandfather and, and my uncles, most of them trained in the boxing gym. And once the occupation happened, there was something called the NSDAers, NSD, kind of the brown shirts. They were recruited by the Nazis to kind of help order and police the streets. And most of them were just Dutch people out of work. Um, saving their own skin. But what they would do is they would, uh, when, when Jewish you know, accountants or shopkeepers were walking home from work, those few that actually still had work, they would want to beat up in the, in the alleys. They would want to beat up on the streets left for, you know, who knows. Um, and this became pretty constant. So the guys from the boxing gym, first of all, they started training the, these shopkeepers and regular guys who, it never knew how to punch or something, but they tried to train them so they could defend themselves. The other thing do, they would do is they would sit and wait in the alleys and when the NS bears, the brown shirts would come and try and beat up the Jews, they would pop out of the dark and beat them up. And uh, this went on for a while until the Nazis kind of got tired of it. So then in the in the town square, well, in front of the Jonas Daniel Meyer plan, there was a, a, diff, a big Sephardic synagogue 
and right across the street from there, there's the Ashkenazic synagogue. And then on Sundays, there would be the marketplace. Okay, so we didn't have eBay back then, obviously, and, and um, Amazon, but they had the marketplace. Everybody could do their shopping. And uh, what the Nazis did was they, they surrounded the marketplace and wouldn't let anybody leave until the people who were responsible for beating up the junior Nazis would um, surrender their weapons. You know, whatever they had used to, to beat up the, the, the conscripted uh, wannabe SS members. And um, the problem was they didn't have any weapons because they didn't use their own hands. So, you know, so it's like they just go on, you're holding out. It's like, no, it was, it was kind of a, an actual little factual story that was in that book, but I'd already heard it from my uncle in a slightly different version. And uh, that was, I think that was kind of interesting. But the, uh, there were a lot of things that my, my family did to help others. Uh, my grandfather and, and his buddies would collect funds to be able to buy Jews back from the Nazis. That didn't always work out. And also there was the kinder transport to get children out of the Netherlands and hopefully to Israel. You know, so there was there were doing a lot of work there to just kind of help liberate or especially get the kids out, you know, so they wouldn't be taken off to the, to the camp. So proud of them for doing all of that. Um, my uncle Leo and his wife Flora, who I mentioned, and their their baby, Alexander, they were all taken to Auschwitz as well and um, did not survive. But he was also one of those guys that was an upstander and physically was taking you know, action to help protect uh, his, his fellow Jews and the people in the city that were being more than bullied, right? So they used their, their strength and their courage for, for good. And it cost them in the end, obviously. Um, and then there's my uncle, Phil, who, I spent some time with him. He took me on a walking tour of Amsterdam, but it was a different kind of walking tour. He took me to the, the home of our of his parents, my grandparents, or my mom, and they all lived, and walked me through when they were arrested and where they were taken to and where were they shipped from there and where they were held and then where they deported ultimately. And you're just walking on these cobblestone streets and you're kind of, you're hearing the sound of the leather boots and you, you can hear the trucks as you know, I mean, the way he told, he was able to share the stories is I got to feel a little bit of um, how real this is and how it wasn't that long ago. You know, it, it just brought it close to home. Um, you know, there was a place called the uh, the Transvaal Plain, which is where they're first set to, and then there was another place called the Hohenzollernberg, which was a theater, and then it has the names of all those that were lost, memorialized, and so here's a. Um, a data point that I want to share with you. In, in Holland, we have the highest mortality, uh, the highest percentage of, of, of our population did not survive the Holocaust. So out of 105,000, um, only a, a little over 5,000 returned where I made it back from the camps. And even though there were more Jews in other lands, you know, there were hundreds of thousands you know, and, and even more in, in other countries. So the, the total uh, mortality was higher, but by percentage, what's impactful to us is, is that society, that civilization that was established in the early 1600s after the Inquisition by the Spanish Sephardic Jews who had left Spain and took root in Holland. And they were later joined by um, Germans and Russians leaving pogroms. In, 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 in later centuries, all of the fabric of Dutch Jewry was, for the most part, gone. And, you know, I remember going to high holidays to the synagogue in Amsterdam, uh, usually on high holidays, Shavuot and Rosh Hashanah, that's where the, even the people that don't normally go to synagogue, you know, you probably see this in church too, but like Easter and Christmas. You know, there's the seats that aren't usually full are all full, right? So we kind of had that. Um, but when I was there, there were barely 50 souls in these in these large buildings. And half of them are just tourists stopping by seeing what's up. And you see the empty seats, uh, the places where we used to be. And, you know, you walk by the, the there used to the shops that used to exist and the, com the communities, the neighborhoods, um, you know, 
and all of the treasures of, of culture that are, 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 you know, in a sense, become almost extinct. Uh, but some of us are able to scrabble some of the stuff back together. I really enjoy our, our prayer book from our synagogue in Amsterdam because it's in Dutch, it's in Hebrew, and it's in Latino. So if you speak Spanish, you can read it. That was kind of code language for amongst, I think, the older generation too. They spoke Latino and, you know, the younger ones were like, what did they say? <laughs> but it's interesting to see that too. Um, but, you know, uh, Philip was a little bit younger, so he probably wasn't part of the, uh, what we call the guardian angels that were going out there and, and uh, protecting as much. But after the war, he did enlist in, um, in, in the British forces and helped liberate France from the Nazis. And then later went on into um, Indonesia and India with the British. And actually he was the, 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 the East Indies uh, Allied Forces boxing champion or something like that. So like, you know, I think he, he did learn some stuff when he was younger and he kind of took it with him. But he was really valuable to me because he filled in some of the blanks, some of the stories that my mom didn't tell me because my mother was a young girl. And, you know, if before if she was 12 when she was taken. So her recall of how life was was a little different than a teenager. Yeah, a male teen would have would have seen things. So it was good to kind of fill in some of the blanks. Um, I've shared this before when I spoke but, um, last year, but I, but I want to share it again because in this picture, this is at concentration camp Westerbork. And these women are dancing the hora. It's a, a, a circular dance that kind of is about connecting the, the circle of life kind of a thing. That's what's celebrated. And this is my aunt right here. And my uncle Ko was in the Dutch Jewish Museum in, in Amsterdam and he was walking around and he was shocked. He was like, there's his sister. And my mother could, might have been over here probably hiding under her mom's, my grandmother's skirt because she was younger. But, you know, this is so weird to see your own relative in a picture in a Holocaust exhibit at a museum, right? And, uh, but he had to take me and show me that as well. So I really appreciate that. You know, Jewish life never stopped. During the occupation, in the camps, and even afterwards. You know, you, you can't squelch something that has been a fire that's been burning inside of us for 3,500 years. There's no way to extinguish that really. Um, people try and, um, you know, we, I think we have that, we have a kind of a resilience that I hope is a beacon for others that, that we can share that. Another one of my mom's paintings about, you know, the Third Reich. Um, this is one of her paintings I think is the most moving because it has to do with what she saw and witnessed as a little girl in the camps, which was death and dying. But the way she processed it was as a, as a, as a fine artist. So she was able to express um, that emotion in a way that we could communicate and, and she could process it, right? One of my first cousin um, talked about him a little bit earlier, but this was the, uh, the highway to, uh, to death. And one of my cousins who, who I think is super interesting, I got to spend time with him, even I met him when he was 80, Jacques van der Stam, first cousin of my mother actually. And Jacques was uh, arrested during the war, during the occupation by the regular police for mischief. And he was on the list to be, to be deported. And my mother remembers when she was at Westerbork seeing all of her little cousins. There were five, there were set, seven of them. He had, he had, there were eight total. They say he had seven brothers and sisters in that family. And they were Spanish Spartan. They were kind of, you know, of, of that side of our, of our tribe too. And my mother remembers the little cracks in the, um, in, in the cattle cars, seeing their little faces and fingers, and they were waiting at my mother saying, Daf Tanta Sonia, by Aunt Sonia, uh, we're going camping. We're going on vacation. They weren't, they were going to Auschwitz. And they were all murdered. But Jacques, the, the police, this talk, talk about the good guys. You know, there were some bad guys, you know, we talked about, uh, like Sam Olai. But this, this chief of police of this, of this particular station in Amsterdam, he saw that Jacques was supposed to be taken away. He was on the list. 
And he just left him in jail for the whole war. And that saved his life. When he got out, I think his coping mechanism, what I understand in my experience about him, he has a, an immense sense of humor. Every second it's a punching. But I think that's how he kind of handled that pain. And um, anyways, true stories. I think that's, that's an engagement or wedding photo of my grandparents. So you can see my, my grandmother, she looks a bit Spanish. She's, she's a Spanish part of Jew. My grandfather is Ashkenaz, um, Prussian. It is, it's probably Germany now. Um, so we're, we come from a mixed, a mixed marriage. <laughs> a, little, a little Central Northern European Jew and, and Southwestern uh, European Jew. It's another one of my mom's paintings of a cattle car, more abstract. There's another one of my mother. See, there's a, there's a digital um, archive. Uh, so you can see exactly when people were born, where they were born, and then where they were, where they died. And so here, like even on, on the other ones, let me go back up to the original. You know, just, just a document. You can see that my, my cousin was uh, not even two years old, or roughly just a little over, two. yeah. Like, I think he was under two when he was murdered. And then um, my others, you know, it has the dates that they were taken away from us and the location. So I think it's important that we document and, and share. It's not a hearsay kind of conversation, you know? I'll go back to where I was in the presentation. Um, and, and across the hall here at the Federation campus, are, is a sculpture that my mother created. It's also commemorates the, what she calls the death trains. And she was on something that was famously called the, the lost train, which was filled up with prisoners from American Belsen. And the, as the allies were liberating the, the nations of Europe, the Jews and everybody else from the Nazis, the Nazis were trying to get rid of the evidence, which were our parents, our grandparents, our cousins, whoever, that were still alive by taking the trains from concentration camps and getting them to extermination camps. So after 17 days on that train, they were finally liberated. My grandmother did not survive that trip, but my mother and my aunt did. And there's a lot of interesting, um, you know, good, good resources about what exactly was happening on the train and where they were going and such. So um, for another time. Another more dramatic painting my mother did, expressing her angst about, about the Holocaust. And there she is when she was living with two of my girls. Now I can start smiling again, because this is my mom after the war, after the Holocaust. She became one of the fastest women in the world in track and field. She was on the same relay team as Funny Bunker's Coon, who had won, won four gold medals in, in London and Helsinki. And they were on the Dutch Olympic team in Melbourne together. And um, the, the Russians had invaded Hungary and the Russians were, were also sending an Olympic team to Australia. And my mom and her teammates collectively decided that they were gonna compete against or with a nation who had just, it was now even then committing the atrocities that they all had experienced. So in solidarity with the Hungary, Hungarian people, they took their Olympic stipend, the money that was gonna send them to the other side of the planet. And many think that my mom's relay team was a shoe in for gold, but instead of going there and competing, they sent their money off for refugee relief and skipped that Olympic. Um, I feel that that was her goal bet. So anyways, I have some of her treasures. That's her with Bunker's Coon in practice in the, in the Netherlands and a few tokens of, of her, her uh, career sit at my house. She also went to Maccabi, the first uh, Maccabi games that we held in Israel after, after nationhood in 1950. And that was pretty neat, you know, rewarding for her. That's in uh, Ramadan near Tel Aviv doing her long jump. Do you see any flying sidekicks pictures of me? I come by honestly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there she's getting, getting her medal at Makati. And the, 
their Olympic team knew, knew her history. They knew that she was a survivor. And uh, you could tell by their faces, they were moved. But, you know, and the cycling, we come by that, honestly, I have to say. Um, but, you know, my father did used to say things like the most intolerable thing is intolerance. And he, we were raised with love and respect for people of all faiths, of all ethnicities, of all cultures. And for people to treat others badly and horribly because of their differences is, um, it kind of goes down, I think it was Ellie Weasel who, who said that, the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is indifference. And when the world stands indifferently by, while bad things happen to others, I think we have, so we all have some of that on our hands. And it could be on the playground. It could be in a bullying situation. And we think, well, it's just, it ain't me. It ain't my problem. Um, but it's always our problem. And I think we're complicit when we don't take action. And uh, Reverend Niemöller, who was taken away to the camps, you know, his, his observation was, you know, when they came for the, for the socialists and they came for the, for the labor organizers, you know, they came for the artists and, and the intellectuals. I, you know, I didn't say anything because I wasn't one of them. And then when they came for him, there was no one left to say anything. Of course, you mentioned when they came for the Jews, of course. But, but the thing is that we should, we, it should never come down to that. You know, we hope it never comes down to, you know, when they come for us, there's no one left to say anything. Now we have to start at the top of the list. Like, uh -uh. we're not going to tolerate the mistreatment of others. Okay, whether it be in a global or social way, or it can be in our own microeconomies, in our classrooms, on our playing fields, in our neighborhoods, even in our own house. How many people don't treat their siblings like the most amazing people on the planet? The, the person that you love the most, how many people treat their siblings badly, right? So that we can always start right there, right at home, you know, treasure those that are closest to us. It's a good place to practice, so that even if they're annoying sometimes. Um, so we're gonna get to the Q and A part here. Um, and I'm happy if, I, if anybody did have any questions, if they came up. Thanks. Time wise, right? We're, we're about there. Did anyone decide to chat? Or, uh, okay. Well, that's cool. Um, so, really, thank everyone for being here. Uh, I hope it was a long, boring history lesson and a little bit more of just sharing some insights and some real experiences. Uh, nothing wrong with history. But, uh, but storytelling is, is also, you know, is a part of that. So thank you everybody for, for being here and continuing to learn and sharing your knowledge with others. Winslet, thank you so much for sharing your family's story and the history, um, a bit of the history of the Netherlands during the Nazi occupation. It's very appreciated. And it always is more meaningful when there's a personal aspect mm -hmm. assigned for all of you um, enjoyed listening to Winslow's presentation as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Winslow is one of our uh, frequent presenters and his stories are always meaning, meaningful and impactful. And um, we really appreciate his continued contributions to the museum and the things that we do. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission, as well as our local community sponsors who made this week's presentations possible. Uh, we have a number of presentations throughout the week, and we hope that you will join us for many of those. You can find them on our website at hmmsa.org slash thrw. And as a reminder, um, on our website, there is an evaluation, and we ask for you to go to our website if you participated in today's program or other programs and give us some feedback so that we can continue bringing programs like this to our community and growing them and building them for everyone. So thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon.